Um, so Juan, do you think we should post that outside of the school for them to read? Somewhere they can sort of oh, oh. spread a couple. <laughs> 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 All right. No, they don't Let's try it and see. Just stand by. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you. I'm Yvonne Maria Jimenez. I'm the president and CEO of Neighborhood Legal Services of Valley County, also known as NLSLA. So welcome. I wanna thank you all for being with us today, both in person and virtually. Hello out there. I also wanna take this special moment to thank our partners, Kilpatrick and Townsend and Pepperdine Caruso School of Law who've made this event possible. So thank you very much. This is not the typical legal aid training conference. Nevertheless, it's critically important that you're here and it's a critical training today. So thank you for being here. Legal aid groups have always played a role in helping low income communities recover from a devastating disaster. We've always played that role for many, many years. And now with global warming, increasing both the frequency and severity of disasters, they, which have had a particular devastating impact on low income families and communities, it is most important that we convene, that we come together to aid our people and communities recover. Disasters both underscore and exacerbate inequality. While wealthier families are able to rebuild and recover, the rippling effect of devastation on low income communities can have an impact for years. It impacts their housing, their education, their health, and their economic stability. And this kind of instability can have a profound impact for generations. But lawyers, law students, paralegals out there, and volunteers from the private bar can work together to help change this narrative. So again, thank you for being here. NLSLA's first experience in disaster legal services was in the aftermath of the 1971 earthquake. And as many of those in my time know that in 1994, a major earthquake, the Northridge earthquake struck the San Fernando Valley. It had a devastating impact on the community and beyond. Our office in Pacoima lay in ruins and the community surrounded, surrounding it was devastated. The organization mobilized to respond to the needs of the community immediately. Within 48 hours of the quake, our advocates were stationed in disaster recovery centers to address individual and family needs and working with federal and state local officials to address the systemic issues. That experience allowed us to build an expertise in disaster legal services, 
When more, and more than a decade later, when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, NLSLA attorneys were called upon to help. And within days, NLSLA was in Louisiana, working with bar associations, loyal referral systems, legal aid organizations, and Tulane Law Schools, helping in that recovery. Today, the organization is but one of 11 legal aids in this country that have received federal funding for legal services in the aftermath of disasters. And it is focused, we have focused these efforts on low-income victims of Southern California fires, and like many other legal aids, operate in these areas impacted by warming community, by the warming climate and precipitous increase in heat-related events, we have realized we cannot do this work without you, the volunteers, the law students, the paralegals, the lawyers, that are so important for these recovery efforts. So thank you so much for being here today. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, who I'm sure you're all very well acquainted with. She has an impressive uh, credentials so I'll go through. Dr. Lucy Jones is the founder of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society and one of the foremost seismologists in the world. Impressive credentials with a Bachelor of Arts magna cum laude in Chinese literature from Brown University. And she holds a PhD in geophysics from MIT. But let me tell you a real quick interesting fact about Dr. Jones, she's also a musician. She happens to play the viola de gamba and gets musical gigs. So maybe we'll see her play one of these days and I'll let her tell you more about that. But back to the science. She has been the voice of science and reason whose expertise has calmed, has been a calm and a beacon in the chaotic aftermath of earthquakes. That's been the history. She is without a doubt the public voice for earthquake science and safety in California. However, today she's working with both the public and private sectors in seeking to increase community's ability to adapt and be resilient to the dynamic changes of the world around them. Dr. Jones's impact on how we prepare, survive, and respond to earthquakes is immeasurable. For those of us in California, we know that. She was always the first person on radio and TV after a major, or even, not even a major earthquake. We are so fortunate to have her here today. So please help me welcome Dr. Lucy Jones. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. And I'll just comment that that 71 earthquake was also a seminal experience for me. I was in high school, but I was visiting my aunt and uncle in Taiwan where I started the Chinese interest. And uh, so the news there was Los Angeles destroyed by earthquake. And I spent three days trying to call my parents, unable to get through. They didn't bother to call me because they lived down by LAX. They had no problem at all in the earthquake, and they were waiting for my birthday to give me a call. So I had a very early experience about media and earthquakes and how disconnected the two could be. Today, I want to take you, I'm going to talk some about earthquakes. I really couldn't do that to you if come and not talk about that, but within a broader context of what it means to be a natural disaster. And I'm really glad to hear your introduction because that idea of the social impact that is shared between disasters, whatever the physical causes are, is significant. And absolutely, it is not equal opportunity. Uh, if you are poor, you suffer much more from any of these disasters. Uh, and there's all sorts of physical reasons why you're more likely to live in the floodplain, you're more likely to live in a building that's vulnerable to the shaking, but then you don't have the resources to recover. So, I'm going to talk about more than just earthquakes, even though that's what, as, as Southern Californians, we tend to think is really our life. And when you think about, let me see if I've got this up and running. Okay, so when you, uh, 
think about you know disasters in Southern California, you're probably thinking about earthquakes. And this is our rather famous model that we put together when I was so up until 19, 2016, I was a seismologist with the US Geological Survey stationed at Caltech. I completed my federal service, retired from the government to go on and start my center. But while I was at the USGS, we created, I led a team that create this model. On, on the left, you're seeing a map of the, the red line is the San Andreas Fault. The earthquake starts down at the Salton Sea and ruptures up the fault, giving that shaking out to all of us. Right? And affecting all of Southern California, probably 15 million people will receive very strong shaking. And our model of it suggested 1800 dead, which actually isn't very much when you consider that that's about seven years of fatalities on Los Angeles County freeways alone. Um, but a quarter million displaced households and about $250 billion in losses. And notice that business disruption, the disruption to our economy, people's lives, people's jobs, equals the direct losses. Uh, from the earthquake itself. And it might feel like this is what you really have to deal with, but in fact, there are plenty of them. We did a similar model for the arc storm, for what would happen if, as has happened in previous centuries, uh, we set up a pattern of atmospheric rivers coming in that keep on going for a month. To make this model, all we did was take January of 1969 and join it up with February of 1986 and put it in one year. And we had losses that exceeded the shakeout earthquake by about a factor of four, okay? uh, up to 12 feet of rain up in the Sierra Nevada uh, and flooding uh, of one quarter of the properties across California. So we may think of earthquakes, but we've got a lot of other options. Right? And that's what we're gonna look at today. Today, we will look at disasters in different timescales. What it means, what do you think about when you think about a disaster? Spend some time with the earthquake, because I know that's what you want to hear. But then look at lessons from the pandemic, as well as what we know from various disasters of what we need to carry through, because your job after the earthquake isn't going to be counting aftershocks like mine is. Your job is going to be helping people deal with the social consequences of the events. So the idea that disasters happen on different timescales. Earthquakes are probably the, you know, the one we think of first, and they're the ones that happen the fastest. An earthquake's over in a minute or two. Northridge lasted for seven seconds. The shakeout earthquake will be two minutes. So just to let you know that you haven't felt nothing yet, and probably many of you are too young to have even felt the Northridge earthquake. Sigh. Okay. Uh, floods might be more like days, hours to days, depending on exactly what feature are you talking about a fast flood. Wildfires can go on for days to weeks. Okay? All of these we still really consider natural disasters. They're abrupt in their onset, okay? but they take more and more time. Volcanic eruptions can go on for months and actually years. I mean, the Kilauea volcano has been erupting continuously since 1983. Uh, but nobody has is so insensible as to live in the path of that. Um, but the pandemic, do you put this on as a natural disaster? I mean, it's a you know natural cause by the interface of human beings with the wildland interface, uh, and it's been going on for years. Right? And the, but the consequences, when you look at what happens to society, are very similar. Emotionally, we respond differently because it's taking too long. We can only there's a Disaster scientists sometimes talk about the finite pool of worry. There's only so much worry you can put into things. So if you're gonna be worried about the pandemic, you probably aren't thinking about the earthquakes. And this is the first public talk I've given in two years to give you a picture of that. Right? Uh, the first one in person, I will say that. I've done a few online, but basically the interest in talking to me went away immediately in the first year and then people started coming back. And it's natural and it's appropriate. When you got a real pandemic to worry about why you're doing why are you going to bother about a synthetic earthquake? But there's another one, climate change, which is going to happen over a century. Right? And we tend to not treat it in the same class because it's taking too long, even though what is coming will be substantially worse. Um, I, several of you know, I, I actually got back from New Zealand yesterday where I was working with what's called GNS science, sort of the equivalent to the US Geological Survey in New Zealand. And uh, Recognizing the change that's happened to public perception in, of climate change in California and in Australia, we had some people there from Australia, because of fires. The bushfires there, the forest fires here have changed public perception of climate change, and it's not yet happened in New Zealand as that imminent risk. They, they are still moving uh, forward more than we are, but uh, it, 
public perception has been changed because of the because we moved back on the time scale because we had rapid onset events that felt more threatening to us. Right? But let's think about what the outcomes are. Look at the pandemic, the earthquake, or the, the flood. Um, fatalities, we've killed a lot more people in Los Angeles County from the pandemic than we ever will from an earthquake. Right? But it happened every day, so we got used to it. Again, that the op rapid onset changes the way we think about it. In the flood scenario, if we handle it right, there won't be death. So we actually ended up not estimating fatalities because that was an estimate of how much people screwed up on warnings and evacuations. And that was a sort of a, not quite a scientific topic. Right? Homelessness, right? We got a lot more homeless out of the pandemic. We expect one quarter million households to be displaced in the earthquake but at least a million and a half evacuees for the arc storm. Now that's not all in Los Angeles County, that's all of California. Uh, and it'll depend on exactly where it goes. Another interesting one on the floods, that's up to choice. When we have a flood control system, there will always be a storm bigger than our flood control system can handle. So whatever you build, however many dams you build, at some point you run out. But where the water goes, when there's not enough capacity in the flood control is up to the flood control managers. So the reality is there will be people deciding who gets flooded. And will they choose to flood the lower income area where there will be less financial losses than the higher income area with more political clout? I think you know the answer. Okay. Um, direct physical losses, that didn't happen with the pandemic and it dominates on many of the other disasters. Um, uh, and then, um, but business disruption, here's another really interesting time. We ended up doing four different uh, disaster scenarios in this, my program in the USGS. In every one, the business disruption was approximately equal to the total direct losses. We did two earthquakes, the flood and a tsunami. So in every case, and basically all we were modeling was businesses closed because of lack of utilities and transportation how that affected the ability of a business to open. And we doubled the losses. This doesn't include traumatized people who give up and leave and customers have now disappeared and your business fails. Right? I found it interesting when we tried to study what happened in the pandemic, one third of restaurants in, in LA County closed permanently because of the pandemic. And that gives us the same sort of ballpark as those other really big disasters that we're thinking about. Well, let's get back to the earthquake because I do know that's what a lot of people want to talk to me about. I want to start with what is an earthquake? To a seismologist, the earthquake is that sudden slip of the block of rock past another that produces shaking as one of its effects. So on the right, you're seeing a picture from Kobe, Japan in 1995. That rice paddy was not you know, planted that way. That rice paddy was offset. You actually are seeing the fault running right down across the screen. It moved down and to the left. The bottom part moved down and to the left during the earthquake, a distance of about uh, two meters, six feet. Um, and that was the physical cause, was that sudden slip. And shaking is one of the consequences of that sudden slip. Sort of like snapping your fingers. You snap your fingers and you have friction that keeps them from moving. I and mean, if you didn't push them together, you wouldn't make a sound. So by the way, anybody who's worried about the fault opening up, if the fault is open, there's no friction, you can't have an earthquake. Just, there's no physical way of producing shaking if the fault actually opens up. Right? It doesn't open up, it slides past it, produces shaking as one of its effects. Of course, to just about everybody else, the shaking is the earthquake, right? And right there, you've got a miscommunication that goes on often when the earth, you know, the seismologist says, well, this earthquake was the movement on this fault and people think they were moves, feeling the movement of the fault. You're not. You're not feeling my thumb moving, you're hearing, you're feeling the, the waves, the vibration that's going on in your ears when I do that snap, right? That fault can go on for a long time. Uh, the Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand was a magnitude 7.9, probably similar to what we will get from the San Andreas fault. You can see, I mean, there's people there for scale. The, the vertical offset on that fault is, a, is about uh, three to four meters in this area. And it went on for, for over 300 kilometers, uh, actually on several different faults. That's one of the things we're now coming to recognize when we have the detail to look. You don't need to have just one fault going in an earthquake. Um, this is a, a, oh, is it not gonna work as a GIF? 
Oh, let me give it one more try. Um, oh, well. I had a gift that went back and forth for what the Ridgecrest earthquake do, so you can see it over distance, but it didn't work. What happens if the fault comes through your house? We were speaking about the 71 earthquake and the San Fernando fault did come up through houses in Silmar. Um, and you can you know, rip them apart. And it, one, you cannot stop the fault from moving. That is the earthquake. That's, you know, you, you know the original Superman movie had him going into the uh, underground and trying to hold the fault together. Nobody else gets to do that. You don't stop the fault motion. So it's the one thing we can't prevent. You can't build to resist this. The only thing you can do is avoid it. And therefore, the state uh, of California passed a law. Uh, I, got, I, I think it was 1978. I better check that to be certain. It's called the Aquas Priolo Act. And um, it prohibits construction of four or more buildings, four or more houses, or any sort of development across an act of fault. So we no longer put hospitals or schools or shopping centers on top of faults. But it's just trying to stop this. It isn't trying to stop the shaking. So you just have to get it far enough off the fault. And there are, you'll see developments out in like San Bernardino where, you know, the parking lot is there for the San Andreas or the San Jacinto fault with the, the target right next by, next door. But at least you aren't going to be going through this. So I, the geologists all have considered a very important development, um, it, but it only is dealing with this one specific sub problem of the earthquake problem. Um, the other thing is it, there's, it doesn't get buildings, require buildings to be removed. So when you purchase a house in California and you are in escrow, then they will disclose to you that you're in what's called an Aquas Priolo special study zone, which means you're within 50 feet of an active fault. And if you were building a new building in there, you would have to go in and image, figure out where exactly the fault was and make sure you didn't build on top of it but a pre-existing building can still be there. Oh. We once were looking to buy a house and we went to visit it and you could literally see the fault scarp come in from the neighboring property, get leveled off to put the pad for the house and then continue out the other side. And it's, you know, it was done before that Raymond fault was zoned and it's allowed to stay in there. We just knew we could never do it because we could never invite a geologist to our house without them just giving us way too much grief. Okay. okay. Um, what I want to do now is I want to talk about how we measure it, magnitude and intensity. I actually have a little movie because that we made for a, a program, a, a separate program, but it helps. Um, uh, it has the videos of how the ground moves. And I, hopefully that this movie is working. Um, yeah. So I'm going to stand up. Oh, wait a oh, Representing the total energy released okay. in the earthquake. It was developed here at Caltech by Bino Gutenberg. People on the Zoom are probably having it fine. We did not set up for sound in here. Anything we can do? You know what, um, easiest thing, Dr. Jones, why don't you just put the mic next to your computer? Okay. <laughs> No, that's not going to work because to go in from Zoom, I've had to turn the sound, oh. and now we're hearing the feedback from that. Uh, I'm going to turn off the sound completely, and I will just narrate without the sound from the movie. I could make it picture myself again. I'll figure out how to turn off the sound. But on Zoom, I'm going to stop sharing on Zoom so that we can, um, uh, I can share again without sound. I know. Okay. Um, okay. So magnitude. Um, can, can we check if people on Zoom are hearing me correctly now? I would like to hope that um, somebody can just make sure that I didn't screw them up. Um, that's that's Bino Gutenberg, who actually had developed the Richter scale. They, they were partnering. Uh, you'll find seismologists always call the Gutenberg Richter scale because Bino Gutenberg was Charlie Richter's boss. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. Oh. Okay. 
earthquake. That is not what you feel. Oh, because there would be an earthquake, you know, like in Inglewood, and people in Inglewood felt it very differently from the people here in Pasadena, and they would talk about it as though it were two separate earthquakes. So they were trying to get through that idea that there's an innate size okay. that is not what you feel. We have been talking about magnitude trying to be so too, uh, long. There's a lot of people who think magnitude's what you feel, right? And actually, that is expressed with something called intensity. So we use the model. Okay, so they're getting it online, and I'll just do it here. Magnitude's one number representing the total energy in the earthquake. Intensity is what you feel. We've been doing, and that they came up with this magnitude scale to help people understand it's not what you feel. We've been using it for so long, people think it is what it's felt. So we have this scale where one is almost nobody feels it. Here's a picture of intensity three. You can see her lights barely going. She's sort of freaked out, but it's hard to see anything at all. You have to get up to intensity five to you start really moving. Here's one in New Zealand. They get more earthquakes than we do. We envy them. Right? Things are starting to really move around, but not really thrown off. People are scared enough. They immediately did their drop and cover, right? Uh, and you occasionally get windows broken at this level. It's intensity six where you start really throwing things off of shelves. And this is one from the Philippines. Notice that it takes a little while for it to get going. And then as it really gets going, you're starting to bring a lot of stuff down. So this is the one where they're always going and taking the pictures in the, the liquor stores with all of the wine bottles broken on the floor. That's intensity six. Intensity seven is where you start really damaging buildings where you see big things being thrown around, some of these taller structures, this will end up with some pretty bad cracks and not be usable after this. But again, it's usually only older construction where it's really coming down. Intensity nine is where you first start really damaging buildings, right? And this is essentially all the damage in Northridge happened at intensity nine, right? Uh, and this is where you collapse buildings. At intensity 10, we've had, upside down grand pianos after earthquakes. They were literally thrown in the air or upside down VW bus, okay? And so intensity 10 is where um, you get the largest damage Brent railway tracks. And, and you know, you feel intensity five, you're scared. You don't have anything bad with you. And really understanding that the worst of it is in those locations is a difficult thing. I, can't quite remember what I said here at the end. So we'll <laughs> uh, hopefully Zoom is still connected and we're, we're cool about this. So you put this all together, right? Here's those descriptions. It began as a completely subjective one. We now have a way of getting it from instrumental data. Here's what it was from Northridge. Notice that how all of LA had at least intensity six, but only the Northwest Valley had intensity nine. And so you've got a small pocket of damage that happened down in Santa Monica. You can see it turns oranger there because of the thick sediments. My point is, is that magnitude doesn't tell you what happens to you. Intensity does, and that's really different. I, when you have a big earthquake, you don't necessarily get stronger shaking. You get shaking over a larger area. Okay? So Northridge was 15 kilometers, the actual fault that produced it. The shakeout earthquake will be about 300 kilometers, right? Um, and uh, the longest earthquake we knew we know of was a magnitude 9.5 in Chile, and this fault was longer than the state of California, right? So the Northwest Valley was strongly hit, that 10 miles. Now imagine that it's 200 miles. That's what will be different when we have the big earthquake. But also, that point is that earthquakes don't happen at epicenters. You might have believed it after all the time Caltech's been telling you this, right? Cal it starts at an epicenter and happens over a surface. Right? And that takes time for that rupture to travel up the fault. So the bigger earthquakes also last for a longer time. So it's not more intense. It's a bigger scale, more people for longer. Uh, let's go back to looking at this model of the shakeout earthquake. This is like the one I showed you earlier, except for now I've put it over the marina instead of over uh, uh, downtown Los Angeles. Some important points to note. You see on the left how it's starting to travel out and there's a weak wave that comes first. That's also called the P wave. It's a compressive wave. It travels faster than the shear wave, which is twisting. The shear wave does more damage. So we can use that information coming from the P wave to tell us that the S wave is coming. That is earthquake early warning. 
If you have Shake Alert or My Shake, those systems are just calculating that the earthquake's already begun and giving it to you before it gets to you. The bigger the earthquake is, the more likelihood you have of a longer time. Because on a, if it's a five mile long fault, it's already long since over. And you, maybe you get a few seconds in the, uh, if you're still in the area of damage, you're only gonna get a second or two. Useful for machinery and such things, but not so much for people. You know, for this earthquake, we're gonna have a minute warning, but we'll have a minute or warning that an earthquake's begun on the San Andreas. We'll only have about 30 seconds warning that it's grown to at least a magnitude seven. I, and, and, and maybe even less than that, that it'll be strong shaking for us. Right? But notice here, Marina Del Rey, 70, 80 seconds into the earthquake, the strong shaking still hasn't gotten there. The other thing, remember I said red's where you got damage. Right now the fault, you have a lot of it. Notice that pocket of red that comes out from it through LA. That is amplification of the shaking in our basin. Basically it's a bowl of jello and you can see it really clearly in this Marina picture. That's why I wanted to put it here. It's relatively long period shaking. Your little single family homes are probably fine. Bigger structures are gonna really have problems, right? And so we could have situations with modern high rises collapse and little houses, okay? It's potentially true because what's gonna be amplified over here in the basin because of this process is gonna to tend to be these longer period, uh, big, long, show, uh, slow movements. Uh, which can, the bigger the structure is, the more likely it is to respond to it, right? So if this is the earthquake, let me see what I, I've got to remember what I have on this. Yeah, what's going to happen? It's got to be where the strong shaking is that you get your damage. Everything you think of from Northridge was in that area right where it's red. But now we're going to have about 10 million people getting at least intensity nine shaking, right? We talk about the San Andreas as our big issue because it's our longest fault. And since the length of the fault is the magnitude, it means it's gonna have our biggest earthquakes. The rate at which the fault moves tells us how often it has those earthquakes and San Andreas is the fastest moving fault. But here in Southern California, it takes a bend. And that means that the area in between, now instead of the plates moving parallel to the fault, they're now moving uh, up into the fault. That's why we have our mountains. That's why Malibu is here, right? The Santa Monica Mountains are part of what are called the transverse ranges uh, or the, you know, the San Gabriels, the San Bernardinos, the Santa Susanos, all that whole band of mountains. I, we label it here as the compression zone, but it, and the geologists will call it the transverse uh, fault system. And there's a lot of them though. Um, yeah, here's the mapped faults of Southern California, right? And that is things breaking up as we're trying to push the plates into a fault with a big bend in it, right? Um, and if, if we wanted to talk about why the bend is there, we could spend a lot longer than we have today. Uh, and it's still a matter of debate. The, re the point being, the San Andreas is the single most likely fault to go because it's the fastest moving. But with a hundred other options, it's probably the next one, not the next one. Right? Getting ready for the San Andreas gets you ready for the others. But you can see that just about anywhere in Southern California is within 10 miles of an active fault and has the potential for the really strong shaking. So your own damage is the San Andreas plus whatever you've got nearby. The San Andreas one though, is not gonna, you know, here in Malibu, it's actually not that bad. Uh, downtown LA, it's very bad. South Bay, not so much. Compton, that area really isn't gonna get a strong shaking from the San Andreas, but it's gonna have enough and everybody else is getting it too. And it's that scale and how do you respond? And that's what's different about the big earthquakes is the, is the how many people will be effective and how much help they would need. So how do we live with it? We like to talk about the resilience. We used to call it the risk equation. Then I really said, let's turn it positive and say it's the resilience equation. But, um, the risk is a combination of the hazard, which is what the earth does to us, whatever faults or volcanoes or landslides or whatever, times how much we put ourselves in line of all of those disasters, times how fragile those resources are. We can build to withstand it if we chose to. Those all make it worse. We make it better by responding effectively and by having the will to recover, the ability to come back in, stick with it, 
and do what's needed to pull us back together. So let's look at the effect each of these different components and what we can do about it. Hazard, you know, we've already said it's pretty much what the earth does to us. Uh, we, the faults are there, we aren't changing them, we can't stop them moving. Um, we might think that we could talk about the time of it. Prediction is a definite uh, desire of everyone in humanity, including, let me tell you, all the scientists. We don't say we can't predict earthquakes because we don't want to. Let me tell you, we want to. We've just discovered that as far as we can tell, it is a random distribution. I mean, there have been 700,000 earthquakes in the last 40 years. Most of them were too small to be felt. You don't care about the timing of every earthquake. You care about the timing of the few that happen to be big. As far as we can tell, that is like, it's like pulling jelly beans out of a jar. It's a random distribution as our best way of modeling what the sizes are with the small ones being much more common than the big ones. So for every seven we put into the jar, we need to put 10 sixes and 100 fives and 1,000 fours and 10,000 threes and 100,000 twos and a million ones. And somewhere below magnitude one, it does appear to roll off, but well below where we can actually record all of them, right? Um, you might think you can get around this by going and looking at one particular fault. We push on it till it breaks. I snap my fingers by pushing until I overcome the friction. The problem is, number one, we only have 150 years of record and that's, you know, none of them move that often. Mm -hmm. uh, we have used geology to cut trenches through the San Andreas Fault and get times of previous earthquakes. Here's data from one location up near Fraser Park, the time between big earthquakes. They average 100 years apart, but it is not like they peak at 100 years. It's now been 170 years. Does that tell us we have to have it right away? No. There was one that was 300, over 350 years apart, actually. And actually, the shape of this distribution, when you gather it up from a lot of them, is best expressed as a Poissonian distribution, meaning the time since the last earthquake doesn't matter. Every year has a 1% chance of having the earthquake. And just because it's been 200 years, you still got basically a 1% chance of having the earthquake. Now, the southernmost part of the San Andreas, it's been over 350 years already. So we might, we sometimes give it 2% chance per year. And we have a lot of fancy mathematical models to decide whether it's 1.5 or 1.7. I don't think we know enough to really worry about which model we use, right? The reality is, is I thought this earthquake would happen when I, before I ended my career. I've already retired from the government. I'm down to just hoping I live to see it, which you probably aren't. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, hazard, it's there. Then there's exposure. What buildings have we put there? This one is too late, right? We've already built California on top of our active faults. So what can we do about fragility? And this is where we really can make a difference, but we are constrained by the fact that building codes are not retroactive and what's already there. You know? um, I want to take one detour to just make my point here. If you remember the earthquake that happened in 2011 in Northern Japan, the tsunami of course was extremely devastating. It was the, the distance that one fault slipped past the other in this earthquake. Previous to this earthquake, the largest we had ever seen was about 35 meters at that, uh, which is over hundred feet, right? Uh, you, I, I showed you a picture of like five meters, that's right. There were 35 meters in Chile in 1960, biggest we'd ever seen, this was 72 meters. And therefore it displaced so much water on the sea floor, the tsunami was so much bigger and was quite devastating. But outside of the tsunami, the city of Sendai is shown here in 2015 or 2012 actually. And they, are, they received the highest shaking of any major city in this earthquake. See the impact? Right. Mitigation works if you build strong enough. The Japanese approach to buildings is uh, more, it's st more stringent than we are. Basically, we're following the same ideas and the same structural, ge uh, structural engineering. But if you as an engineering firm build a tall building that is damaged in an earthquake, you lose face and you have a strong professional incentive to make sure it doesn't happen. In the United States, if your building is damp, you know, you get it past the building department, you're home free, your job is done. And it's a really big psychological difference about how it's, it's gone about. 
Our biggest issues here in California are older buildings. Again, your poorer people are more likely to live in the bad buildings. Unreinforced masonry is the worst. In Los Angeles County, every, every jurisdiction has mandated retrofit of these buildings. Uh, so in LA County, it's um, uh, not as nearly as big an issue as it used to be. Uh, but the point of the retrofit is to make sure the building doesn't kill you, not to make sure it's usable. And almost all of them will be unusable after the earthquake, um, if, if they got strong enough shaking. Right? Um, and outside of Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, only two jurisdictions have mandated retrofit. Overall for the state, it's about half. Um, soft first story, what happened in Northridge? Right? Uh, that's the first floor has big openings. It's weaker, structurally weaker than the upper floors. That concentrates the deformation into that lower floor and is much more likely to lead to failure. So just giving, adding strength to the lowest floor, the open floor to make it match the rest of the building greatly improves your chances of, of surviving. Uh, one estimate is that this is so cost-effective, it's about $22 saved for every dollar spent on this retrofit. It's like the most cost-effective one we have. Mandated by the city of Los Angeles in the program where I was at the mayor's office in the year 2014, the law was passed in 2015. It's almost completely passed. A dozen other jurisdictions have passed uh, legislation about this. Madison actually dealt with it, uh, passed a, a voluntary retrofit, but they only had seven buildings to deal with, so that's a big issue. There are about 13,000 of these buildings in the city of Los Angeles. Many, let's see, Santa Monica, Pasadena, Burbank. I'm, I'm not going to get them all. There's a dozen <laughs> cities. I know those ones have all done mandatory retrofit, and they're moving forward on it. Non-ductile concrete buildings are a serious type of problem. Um, this, you know, think of LA commercial construction from the 50s and 60s. Right? Uh, in the 71 earthquake, the collapse of the, the Veterans Hospital demonstrated significant flaw. That was a new building. Um, they stopped building it that way. The 1976 building code prohibits that type of construction, but we have a lot of those older ones. And these are our biggest source of life loss because concrete's heavy. When it collapses, it tends to kill people. <laughs> We've also discovered problems in steel moment frames. If you remember the discussion after the 94 earthquake, the cracks in the weld, steel is supposed to be ductile. That's why it wouldn't collapse. It might not be usable, but it's not gonna collapse in an earthquake. Um, but welds made, became brittle. They formed cracks. They propagated into the rest of the building. This is a collapse from the 95 earthquake in Japan. We didn't actually collapse any buildings in LA because the earthquake didn't go on for long enough. Um, but those are a, an existing problem where downtown Los Angeles is probably going to see the collapse of a high rise in a big earthquake. And just think what that does emotionally, forget who's in the building. Um, okay, I already said this. Retrofit of software story is just really a good thing and it's going on in a bunch of places. New buildings, you'd think we've got it done, right? We have a building code that says, figure out what's the strongest shaking you've got at least a 2% chance of getting in 50 years. So return period of something like 2000 years. Right? Don't collapse, don't kill people in that. And what that actually has become is a 90% chance of not collapsing. I mean, this is all models, right? Um, realize that a 90% chance of not collapsing and your worst shaking, unlikely shaking, seems really good for one building. But for the city, that implies 10% of your new buildings collapsing. And um, now it's probably better than that because they have margins in them, but they're still, they are not building to make it usable. They're making it to not kill people. Philosophically, they said, if you want to make a stupid financial decision, that is your choice to make. You just can't kill someone in the process. The role of government is to prevent you from killing people. The problem is, what do you do when you don't have those buildings anymore? And they start recognizing the economic impact of it. This is the city of Christchurch in 2010, about 450,000 people, but as you can see, the buildings look a lot like California, don't they? And they have the same building code. They had their design earthquake in 2011. This is, it was only a 6.3, but it was literally in the middle of the city. You see that line of smoke? That's where the fault ran. So the fault ran through the city and caused, very, caused the design level of shaking right down through the center of the city. They had quite a bit of collapse of old brick buildings, including Christ's Church, the cathedral that the city was named after, which has been sort of a crisis for the place. Um, the only collapsed buildings were 1960s era, non-ductile reinforced concrete, just like we have. They had 180 dead in, in those two buildings. Um, 
but and the modern buildings, not one of them collapsed. And the building officials, we did our job. Well, 1800 had to be torn down because they were so badly damaged they couldn't be used. They wiped out the central business district and eliminated all of those businesses. They have a higher suicide rate in the time coming after that. And uh, they recovered because they have 95% insurance coverage on these buildings. We have 10% insurance coverage. We don't have the money coming in that would allow us to rebuild. So we may think we've got it solved and we will not be killing a lot of people, but we may very well be bankrupting a lot of people. Um, so how are we gonna respond to it? Well, we'll probably do that pretty well. We do response really well. We emotionally really like it. We actually did a study once. We were willing to spend eight times as much money on responding to something already damaged than we were willing to prevent it from being damaged. And um, so, and there's not a lot that we as individuals, I mean, the, the, first, uh, the first responders are gonna do everything they can. We sometimes call them second responders. The first responders are your neighbors um, and indeed, uh, most people will be rescued out of down buildings by the people around them. Uh, and we'll probably do it decently. Right? We need to remember the one thing is that we do have aftershocks, that when one earthquake happens, it increases the probability of another. Sometimes it won't happen, a lot of times. Sometimes it does and you trigger another earthquake, sometimes even bigger than the first one. Right? A, a main shock is an aftershock is, that happens, or a, a foreshock is a main shock that happens to have a really big aftershock. Right? It actually statistically all fits within a distribution. So once one earthquake happens, you are going to be having more and about 5% of the time you will have another one that's bigger than the first one. Mm -hmm. um, will to recover. How are we going to be able to let people come back? And this is where it gets back to what you guys can do uh, really importantly. Um, and I'm also realizing I've managed to use up a little more time than I thought. But I would point out that, that when we think about a city, an engineer sees it as a system of systems. We have pipes that go in first, then we have buildings, then we have commercial structures, then we have power systems, then we have communication systems and the transportation systems. And to keep society functioning, we need to keep those systems going. So this is way more than an individual building. There's this in the critical infrastructure that needs to be kept going. And this is where I mentioned at the beginning, the di business disruption comes because these don't keep on going. The necessary systems that we have for keeping life going is dependent on those critical functions going on. And this is really what we need to do as a society to get through. Resilience is dependent on making sure that these are coming through uh, and making sure that people are still there. Because when you look at what happens with an earthquake, people are scared, they're traumatized, people get up and leave. Okay? Uh, the only years that Los Angeles has lost population were 1971 and 72 after that Silmar earthquake and 1994 and 95 after the Northridge earthquake. People don't wanna stay. So how do we keep it going? We need to make sure that our economic system, I mean, I, I so, you know, especially when you're talking about activities like yours, you know, capitalism, that's not <laughs> what I'm trying to say here. Economic activity represents people's lives. It's the assets that they own. It's their ability to go to work. And we have an expected growth. It's a healthy economic system. When you have the disaster, you lose a lot. You not only lose your assets, but people can't go to work if there's no electricity, if there's no transportation, right? What we are trying to do is to recover quickly enough, get back to where we were, that we don't cause fundamental permanent changes in the disaster. This is sort of what we did in Northridge. You know, we were fully back up and running because 40% of people had earthquake insurance. FEMA moved in with huge grants and they hired contractors and those hired subcontractors and we got the economic engine going quite quickly. It doesn't have to happen that way. If you look at what happened in Katrina, it's more a catastrophe model that so many people went away, they couldn't get things working. And you don't have nurses there, so the, the hospitals weren't open, so the teachers couldn't come back because they had nowhere to care for, for their elderly parent, and then there weren't any schools, so your other workers weren't coming back. And the whole economic system came apart. And if you think about the area under these curves, the losses in that catastrophic response when you can't get the economic functioning again can dwarf what happens in the disaster itself. So how do we speed it up? Mitigation is huge. I'm really proud of how many 
communities here in Southern California have done, dealt with a softer story, especially because that's a very large part of our dis displaced households. Um, you know, Los Angeles lost 49,000 housing units in Northridge, you know, to lose a quarter million in this earthquake. I think that's down because of the retrofit that's been going on. Um, planning makes you ability to respond better and get these things going more quickly. And you guys planning now is probably huge. And then somehow getting enough money coming in. That quick influx of money cannot be replaced. And our insurance system is supposed to be the way it's handled and it's not working. Um, let's go back to think about these other disasters. I'll take just a few more minutes. Um, uh, the biggest problem is that as the time dress stretches out, our perception of risk goes down. And there's a whole area of um, study on risk perception. I've, I've been sort of half turning into a psychologist recently. I've been working with these psychologists who study perception of risk. It was like, oh, people have reacted to me the way they were, right? We are of evolution of risk. Risk began as an emotional component. And it's our ability to respond to the threat of a predator, our fight or flight response. It needs to be quick and it needs to be emotional. That is the way in which we decide to take action. Okay. Um, I think I want to just point out that they've studied this. They have different things. We have an analytical system. It's parallel to it. It's numbers. It's slow. It's more accurate, but it does not control the decision to act. And one of your problems is us scientists and engineers, we live with analysis. We live with numbers. We work out these numbers and we develop an emotional response to it that compels us to act. Most of the rest of you aren't getting an emotional response out of those numbers. And we just think we got to give you more numbers and you're going to come where we are. And that's been one of the fundamental problems that's happened in how to communicate about it. I said it requires emotional uh, engagement to act. I'm trying to remember, right. You may react emotionally to the predator. You probably don't react emotionally to the building. You, know, you aren't looking at that building and go, oh, what's the problem with that one? Right? Uh, when we did the shakeout model and showed how fires were going to consume the city, we got a lot more emotional response to it and got a lot more action because of it. So this is really true. The psychologists have studied this in, in great detail. They've also showed, and these are some various studies, that the action needs to be useful and it needs to be personal. So if you show somebody, a child they can help, a large percentage of them will want to help them. If you, at the same time, have recited a picture of the six children that can't be helped, you will get substantially fewer uh, requests to, or uh, offers to help you, right? We don't do uh, arithmetic very well. Our emotions are not good, uh, don't do arithmetic very well. And so the emotional response, that decision to act is not scaled, right? We have to have a connection to it too, right? The more people are involved, the less likely we are to do it. When you think of the Syrian refugees that were coming into Europe a few years ago, hundreds of thousands desperately needed help, very little response to help them. This picture showed up and suddenly the, the donations skyrocketed for about a month. So when it's personal, when you can see the difference you're gonna make, you, you are much more likely to act. When you just tell people, I need, there's so much help, we have thousands that need it, then you're actually less likely to get the help they call it psychic numbing, but it's really demonstrable because we need it to be, we need to feel empowered. We need to believe that our actions make a difference and we need to have a, an emotional connection to it. Um, the problem is, uh, certainly I'm wondering if I should cut off, but this is actually. Berta, we didn't plan for question and answer, but I'm enthralled and I have a question and I think we should take a few questions. Okay, so, yes. Yeah. yeah the, the, what my point being is we find patterns even when they're not there. That emotional need to find a way of being safe, we use our brains. That's how we succeeded. We didn't have the muscles, right? But the problem is we make the patterns even when they don't exist. Uh, consider the word disaster itself means ill starred from a belief that it was fate and you didn't have any control over it, right? That's a pattern that would explain it. Why did this city get hit and this one not? It was fate, it was written in the stars. Deeply wired in us, and so we keep on trying to find the patterns, including blaming the victim. This is the part that I wanted to get to. We are wired to blame the victim because if it was their fault, then I can protect myself by not making their mistakes. So we used to see, say it was the people who sinned and therefore God struck the city, right? But now we say, why didn't you just evacuate? Even though there were no plans for evacuating without a personal car, 
right? Very, very strongly wired in there. And um, I'll leave it there, just that the emotional response, that need to find blame is a way to protect ourselves. It's like with the pandemic. If I can believe it's not that bad, and you wearing a mask is telling me it really is that bad, so I'm angry at you for breaking up my worldview. I don't get vax vaccinated because taking that vaccination and the real risk associated with it is admitting that this is a really dangerous disease. And I feel safer if I don't do that. And I think that's the bottom line I want to end with. We would rather feel safe than be safe. And without an internal fact checker, we often confuse the two. So, thank you. I've been enthralled. It's fascinating. And you have before you an online uh, community of advocates that advocate on behalf of low income communities. You obviously have been at the table with decision makers, elected leaders, mm -hmm. on preparation for disaster. Yeah. Do are there people at that table that represent the community that we represent, the low income community that we be at the table for a voice for these individuals and these communities? on how to prevent and how to respond. It depends on which table. I think that's probably an obvious answer. The closest I have been involved was this year that I spent with Mayor Garcetti uh, in the mayor's office developing the seismic resilience plan. And I was impressed to the degree that there were people at the table for that. That was uh, up front and center on a lot of this. Um, that said, whether the actual plans accomplish that, <laughs> It is a different matter. Uh, I have at the other big program I've been advocating. I mean, so what happened in LA, like this mandated retrofit of buildings? Rich building owners have to spend their own money to fix the building so the people who are living with them will not be hurt. And the mayor was able to get the building community to agree to that. But that is what happened. And that was very much, I mean, the mayor had people, those people at the table. The other big thing I've done is trying to change the building code. Why should we be building to be a complete financial loss? Let's add about 1% to the price of construction and we could have reusable buildings. Uh, at that table, I've never gotten past the developers. So no, we haven't had them there. We've gotten it through the legislature. We got it completely through the legislature twice, uh, or no, we got it through the legislature once and Governor uh, Brown vetoed it. And then we got it through the assembly and got it uh, stalled in the Senate the second time. So. Question. Up in the back. Um, you mentioned that people are more likely to want to spend money after a disaster. Is there, um, like what's the most successful way to encourage them to look at mitigation? We're actually having lots of talks about mitigation and what and and I'm getting more and more towards working with the psychologists. So there have the question was how do we encourage mitigation knowing that we have this prejudice against it? Um, the engineers living with numbers just think we need more numbers. And in fact, I'm going to be in, uh, there's a big project being started up on the climate change front trying to demonstrate the cost effectiveness, the, you know, get a good, good cost benefit ratio on doing the mitigation, won't that bring everyone along? Um, and I convinced them to add a part saying, let's look at the psychology of why people aren't doing it. And because uh, the easiest way to deal with your fear of climate change is to not think about it, it's a long ways out. And uh, giving more numbers to make you more afraid is actually re decreases the level of engagement. Um, so, um, You've asked the $64,000 question. We just, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we change it? I, I'll take one moment, I didn't. The approach I'm taking to climate change is I've started a new project where we are bringing together climate scientists who know what we need to do, the social scientists who understand these emotional barriers with musicians who know how to evoke emotions to try and create music to inspire action. Uh, that's where I've gone in a pretty esoteric or sort of crazy corner because I've, I haven't found an answer so far to that question, and it's pretty frustrating. Other questions? Yes. So I guess I don't usually get somebody in the room who's been that in the middle of earthquake mitigation policy. So I have to ask a kind of alarming question, but are gas lines and utility lines prepared for this in Southern California? 
a lot better than they were than I started when I started this project. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, it's probably the thing I feel best about that and the software story buildings. Um, when we did the shakeout scenario, which was in 2008, um, it, we are going to have a lot of fires and there's probably no way around that with gas lines continuing to run under the city. We also have multiple gas lines, petroleum pipelines, um, and electric lines that cross the San Andreas Fault, right? And all in, in narrow lifeline corridors. So because there's only a few passes. Cajon Pass has two petroleum product pipelines and natural gas pipeline that cross each other at the San Andreas. <laughs> they are all going to break instantaneously. Our pipeline model for that event said explosion. The gas company has retrofitted its lines crossing the San Andreas. The petroleum product pipelines have not, and we did not get that bill through state assembly either. Um, so uh, some of them, yes, some of them, no. The other big one is pipes is water. They don't blow up on you, but if they don't get your water, when your pipe, when your water line breaks next to your sewer line breaking, that's a serious issue. Uh, part of the LA project is a really major retrofitting go on with the LA DWP. The problem is most of our other water companies are very small, do not have the resources to do that. Uh, only in Los Angeles is there a major effort towards uh, uh, retrofitting that. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of a good follow up question to that. So there was a public campaign for a long time that said be ready for 72 hours if you're able to still shelter in place for water. Um, what's a realistic amount of what you would actually want? Like two weeks? All right, so what I end up answering that question is, however much water you have, get some more. <laughs> because, because if you can't afford to put dinner on the table, encouraging to store two weeks of water is a pretty tough thing to do, right? If you've already got a week of water, and are you going to be then like trying, you know, it, it becomes so, uh, there's a lot of people that are really involved in prepping who then become quite, um, but combative about what's the right number. And I refuse to give a number for that basis. Um, the other thing is to try and be creative. What are your water resources? Make sure you have, your, if you have a tanked water heater, make sure it's strapped down properly and will still be there. And as soon as the earthquake's over, go turn off the inflow of water so you don't contaminate it, okay? There's, there's one place. Um, if you've got a swimming pool, you got water to flush your toilet, uh, you don't want to drink it, presumably, but you've got a lot of water for other resources, and it's a really big resource that maybe you want to offer to your neighbors. Right? The other thing is I would just, I, again, I could have spent a whole talk on this, and sometimes I do. More important than any of those things is knowing your neighbors and planning together. So if you belong to any sort of organization, um, actually, I was, uh, I, I'm now working with uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, not just to help individual churches get more prepared for coming disasters, but to connect with each other and think about ways in which they can help each other. Because, you know, we get a bad earthquake, San Diego may be okay, and maybe they'll be able to come and help us. That sort of connection between people who want to care for each other is probably the most important thing we do. And within that, in every place you can, store as much water as you can. I, I think our modeling said it was going to take up to six months to get water back into every building in Southern California. So you can't store six months worth of water. Yeah. Um, in the uh, aftermath of Katrina, there was you know significant sort of breakdown in the rule of law. Uh, I'm curious, sort of, is that something that policymakers are thinking about in this context, and what sort of things can we do to prepare um, for kind of social unrest? I would suggest on Katrina. I, so I actually, I wrote a book on natural disasters and one of my chapters was on Katrina. And to do that, I then said, okay, I got to figure out what, how bad it was. A large amount of the news reports of the breakdown of social order weren't true, right? Um, there were, there were, a, and I think that's this blame the victim thing. If we can see, think that they were bad people and that's why they were there, I'm not gonna put myself in that role. Uh, when you actually, dig it through, what was true was a remarkable number of African-Americans shot for looting that weren't looting. There were people trying to get out of New Orleans who were met at the bridge getting out of the area by the Jelantes holding guns and forcing them back into the floodwaters. Um, there's some, but it's, um, 
It's not all it's cracked up to be. It is a slightly divisive point within the disaster, disaster sociology community. Um, it's definitely a lot less than people imagine it to be. Um, it's also clear that in a place with a lot of uh, social inequity, if you aren't too terrified, it's a time to get back. So actually what they think is likely is that immediate aftermath will be extremely helpful. The, the hum, humanity faced with the real crisis is remarkably helpful. When you haven't had a shower in a week and things are coming apart, and that's when they think the social unrest will become much worse. Um, up until 2010, my colleagues in that field insisted that there'd never been real documented um, social unrest at any scale. It did happen in Chile with the big earthquake that they had. Um, it is a, was a society well characterized by a high level of social inequity, um, but I can't, and I have to remember, I was watching it like America isn't, come on guys. Um, so I find it a slightly open question uh, with researchers mostly on the side that it won't be that bad, but recognizing that that could also be a bit of wishful thinking. Yeah. So we could, we could we could do this for a long time. time. You yeah, probably have really things. Time. I apologize. I wish we had more time. We have a couple of other um, things we want to get to on this really cheery note that you just ended. Thank you, Charlie, <laughs> for bringing that up. Uh, you know, on the heels of the January sixth uh, hearings the other day, I think all we could think of is social unrest, right? Um, but um, I want to thank Dr. Jones. This was thank incredible. Um, and. I I just want to say, I think one of the one of the more recent talks that you gave, it was on Zoom, was for ENLA, oh, yeah. which is the Emergency Network of LA, which uh, NLS is a part of. And, and so it is part of this whole emergency response network that, um, uh, that we're all here is, is volunteering for. And so with that, I want to, we're going to do a tabletop exercise about what happens when an earthquake hits Los Angeles. So as you uh, walk out, there is a table, where is it? Um, I think it's to right outside the door. Look for your name, and there will be a uh, a number next to your name. You're assigned to a table outside where we had lunch, and so everybody's going to be sitting in tables. You're all assigned a little role as we do this tabletop exercise. So once again, thank you, Dr. Jones. I will turn it to I didn't want to have any. <laughs> Allergies. Yes. So I think so. Yeah. Yeah. On a long term risk. On a short term risk, it's very common. That's actually this whole climate thing. It's like, oh, I realized you know, the music had it was like, to give up in despair, right? It's really depressing because it is. Yeah. Know, that's not the point. Yeah. Yeah. They did actually. They did. Sure. They did. Um. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think it's just that one. And then said before you want to get a good he was in that Okay, that's okay. But what is it? It does keep you. Right. It's like they didn't do that. Right. My brother's house. They, they, they don't pay it. So, I mean, reality is what happens when you want to be outside? That's right. And we're working on that. But right now, we're trying to send an idea of uh, double yeah. Doing mitigation. It did a, it, yeah, it did a lot of good. I will say that my brother's, you know, having been in my brother's house. Yeah, we scared me. It's like, um, I have a two story house. 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 It depends. So, are you in the flats or up the hills? Sort of. Yeah, I just took a lot of people. Yeah, it's a good lot of people. Well, the fault is actually on the other side there. So that means you have a relatively thin level of sediment, which is good. Um, when was it built? Oh, then you should be okay. All right, because the building code changed because of the marriage return. Oh, it's my, built in the 97 code to apply. My notes, that's that's work. Work. I lived through both of them. I remember, I think uh, I was in high school. Not right. 71. 71. I was, I, was, I, was, I was in the I was in the eleventh grade. I was in Taiwan, and I literally the notes. And it was my my uncle was with the CIA. It was during the Vietnam War, and he was in Vietnam, and family was up there. And now I got to live in Taiwan and do something more interesting. And but the news on um, Armed Forces Network in Taiwan. Ellen was destroyed by her. <laughs> For a kid, you were like in trauma. Hey, I remember I'm I was asleep, and I just remember my mother running into my room because I'm the only child, and, right. and just jumping on top of me, like, "What the hell is going on?" <laughs> that was the '87 earthquake. Oh yeah, so '87, I was driving my one-year-old to his daycare. Me all the time. I was the driving at the office with my three-year-old. Uh, yeah, and I was like, actually, we had like noticed this leak out of our. Uh, axle that morning, and we sort of keep boy along the ground. And then I'm driving along the ground. This was in Pasadena, so you're going to be your nose and play. And then my radio was virtual because the campus didn't have lost transmission. No, it was all virtual. Damn it, we just bought this car and everything's breaking down. And then I realized that the light poles were moving too. Were you leaving? Well, he were not even feeling about that. Well, I was, yeah, I was working with the nice I'm curious. I mean, I just, just take so, I mean, so many people. You were yeah. yeah. an essential to our community. You no, use the guards. I wonder, like, how quickly do you start? It was one or two. Oh, oh. Well, you see, right, so back then, we literally, sorry. So oh, we just need lots of people. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. We're having yeah. Ryan there. They were going to go to their sites. All of us. Oh, I'm sure. They didn't actually. So, wait, 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 wait. Can I take your, your badge off? It's okay. I'm still looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I you know, with your narrows, we have to get to the lab and pull off eight presents. Oh, right, right, right. right. Now it's oh, automatic. Yeah, I'm going to take a couple. Okay. One, two, and three. Yeah, this one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. I'm going to work tomorrow. We didn't go to film school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here with photography. But I think that should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's only been. We have the system. I don't mean, I actually don't mean that. I just think you and Logan. They're coming back in. You start looking. I mean, like, I probably in being in the year. Coming back. <laughs> She's picking them up. I'm like, I'll pick the one that's empty. Yeah, I'll 
so we have uh, there are there you hear them I hate when I hear my Thank you. We I'm staying. I actually have some. I don't have any crack. You want me to take it? I can like be cluttering. I had snacks all the way. So now my little net. I could have done a whole. You can kind of see them coming. There's a little bit of a. I mean, I think that outside of whatever plant is. Right. But largely. But all our hurt did Relative. All the kids in the family were the only two. And that's so. That's right. The Scott Hall slow, but the sort of creative just feel. Well, I'm I'm um, putting that in my head. I'm gonna start all Slovak. Okay. If you had a paper in 2004 mm -hmm. on risk is feelings and risk is analysis, so, yeah. and then he actually said it's called risk is politics. And now and Love it. signing yeah. up. It's really good. And it's sort of well, you know, it's like that. I had a one point so, natural experiment with this when I was a in a studying in a classroom with the 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 and the 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 and I'm like, if you're crazy, you know, I love that. And we have Well, the psychic we have a church of Europe. 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 We have a church of I realize that she hasn't got a chance to her high school. How often? I think like I can't even write it. I'm watching Oh, perfect. That, that triggers you to make a big And then there's uncertainty that word. So if you don't know where it's coming, you have a to work on you. I'm an artist. She said, sure, can you pay me? Oh, you have to do it. Oh, you have to do it. You can't 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 do so all of us take off of our shoes. Once next we get into the regular chairs. Perfect. Just make it different on how what we're doing. The IT program. And I feel like I'm taking the fact that we sit here.